For a moment, I would like you to close your eyes and think, which one would you like better? A serene, calm place, nature, pristine, no noise, no pollution, or would you like to be at a place that's so crammed, a lot of noise pollution, stress, now, don't sleep. Open your eyes. All right? Most of you would come up with the answer that you would like to be at a calm, nice, pollutionless, less stressful environment. Right? But the reality is people all over the world are moving from rural areas to urban areas or from villages to cities. This is despite the fact that, you know, Every person in a city writes articles about the fact that life in a city is crazy, is stressful. There is data to back this up too. This is 1950s. The urban population, there were only two places which had more than 50% all over the globe. By the time it's 2020, you have most places are getting to the 80, 90%. There's India, China, and parts of Africa left. When it's 2050, there's only few countries in Africa, less than 50% are in rural areas. This growth is exponential. Throughout history, it's been flat or it's been growing at such a low pace. But by 2050, it's supposed to reach 70%. Now, before we get into the reasons of why people move to cities, we've got to define what a city is. A city is defined, if you go online to dictionaries or various scientific articles or uh, political articles, it's defined as a place that is an incorporated human settlement. Humans settle initially, you know, we have a house, a group of homes together make a hamlet, and when the hamlet has a church or an inn at the center, it becomes a village. From there, when it has a marketplace, it becomes a town. And from the town to the city, what changes is the number of people. So most cities that we see today, it's defined a city based on the number of people that are living there. Now, that also changes according to the place. Like if you're in Nebraska, the city is with 20, uh, a 20,000-people town is termed a city. Once you're in Connecticut, it's 100,000 people. I come from a village in India. 30,000 people, it's a rural village. All right? So that's the difference. That's the definition difference, and it changes. But end of the day, the one thing about cities, it's about people. Why is it about people? Because when you have people, you are creating an ecosystem. There is transactions between people. There's value being exchanged. And that's what makes cities. It's nothing else. It's not some kind of resources. It's not because there's iron ore over there, or is gold over there. It's true that places with gold and iron ore have become cities, but there are many out there that have all these things and have never become cities. So the question is, why are all these people moving to cities, despite the fact that, I've, as I've told you, everybody knows this. It's, it has more pollution, noise pollution, or real air pollution, stress life, but still people are moving to cities. Are people dumb or crazy at this point. Can't be, right? The, the, the knowledge of the crowd is way better than somebody writing in a magazine, right? So it just can't be that all these people are really crazy. So the reason why they move to a city is because of the opportunity. The opportunity for a job to feed yourself, to feed your family. Even though the village might be beautiful. You don't want to die in poverty today. You would rather die due to lung disease, due to pollution 20 years from today, right? <laughs> Same, it, it's just like the cancer medication. All those medications have after effects. You will lose your nervous system or maybe you will lose your kidneys in the next 10 to 20 years. But if you don't take that, there's a very high chance you're gonna die in two months. That is the reason people move to cities. It's not because they are dumb. It is due to the opportunities. Now, 
historically any village that has become a city has grown because of a particular reason and that reason is there is that opportunity and people are searching for that opportunities so if you take san francisco before 1837 there were only 200 people in that village by 1850 when gold was discovered there was 100000 people they came from all over the world japan china peru and from the other side of the us there was a the land trail the sea trail the ocean people just wanted to get there you take houston it was the oil boom there's silicon valley you have the tech boom detroit the automobiles came there the word through word of mouth through your friends some guy you know who got a job over there he told you hey come on over you come to a university over here why because you know that there's an opportunity so if you look at a city there's always how it grows is there's some specialized thing that's happening and those core people have come there and as they come you see that they have made wealth and then the other people follow and there are auxiliary industries that come around it so let's take a port city so the core industry is shipbuilding and there can be welding around it and as all those people come over there then you have to service all those people with restaurants entertainment and before you know it it grows the industry could be different but the process remains the same you have people going to a city people the large inflow of people and that becomes a city if you look at the graph if you see early cities even if you take bridgeport initially there were very few people that's the early stage that's the fermentation stage and then the word spreads about this boom that's possibly happening there people come in larger droves and then it gets to a maturity stage the maturity stage could be due to different reasons it's just saturated there's no more reason for that industry to survive or maybe there are laws that prevent other people from coming in and then it could be a decline or it could be just a mature stage over there so if you look at that graph the village to a city it follows something called the s curve of innovation so what the s curve of innovation is any new innovative product or technology that comes over there there are initially only very few users those are the early adopters after that it spreads and at some point it's like wildfire and a lot more people come in and it reaches a stage where it kind of matures why it maybe it's because like at the pc everybody has a pc but then what happens is there is a new technology that comes in so there is an area of discontinuity if you look at it and then people jump on to the next one and the boom happens over there and when you think that's over somebody the human ingenious mind finds something else and we have mobile and after this there might be blockchain there might be ai i don't know what's going to happen but it's going to happen so we have to be willing and open for change if you look at industries it's this is not just about products or it it's the same with companies if you take amazon they started with e-commerce right they they did one s curve and then they had aws they wrote they're riding another s curve before that's over they've already figured out echo and ai take apple they had the pc the computer the mac and after that there was a lull there was a discontinuity or there was almost a dip to the decline and then they came up with the ipod so millions of it everybody had an ipod they came up with the iphone and now they have the earbuds there's something that they are innovating all the time now companies or technologies that do not innovate what's going to happen is they're going to go through the decline phase kodak was here they didn't change and they just perished cities are also pretty much the same you have to grow if you don't grow there's a very high possibility that you will perish let's take bridgeport let's see if this is an s curve this is the population of bridgeport from 1800s to 2014 looks similar just like an s curve right so there was initially there's nobody here some people coming for fishing and whaling then the manufacturing boom starts and then post world war 2 there's a deindustrialization deindustrialization period and there's that maturity stage that maturity stage has been going on for too long small cities many times do not get the second s curve there are various reasons for that one being people become lethargic or complacent or they don't want to change 
It's, it's in our nature. You know, we had a comfortable life and we don't want to accept change. They forget the fact that change is the only thing that's constant. And the moment you do not, you are, or you are not willing to accept that, there's a very high possibility you will perish. So in the case of Bridgeport, after the deindustrialization happened, a lot of the industries in Bridgeport moved out. There were 500 factories in Bridgeport in 1940s, and many of them moved out or they perished because they, not, they don't exist anymore. So the new technologies did not come here. And then what happens? So you have a city that is taxing people and people are leaving. And the, the people that are left are to have to pay for the people who have left also, the ones who are here. Before you know it, more people will start to leave. More companies will start to leave. Taxes will go up. And then what is left is the present. Crime rates have gone up. Taxes have gone up. Less people coming in, more people going out. The question is, how can Bridgeport or small cities like Bridgeport ride the next S-curve? Because if we do not ride that next S-curve, these cities will perish. So some of the possible ways are you have to attract capital and you have to attract people. Capital, once the money is there, people will come. So how can money come here or how can people come here? There are two sets of guys you have to bring over. One are the small entrepreneurs, the innovators, and then the big businesses. Tax benefits or something like that have to bring them in. That's from the city level, the city government. They have to bring them in. They have to ensure that law or justice prevails because nothing happens to anybody's life and property. People have to feel safe to come in. From a university level, universities can start attracting students or courses that are ahead of the curve. See, earlier, as I said, during that S-curve, you want to be ahead of the curve. You can't come over here and try to teach the courses that are good for jobs over here, right, towards the end. So in the case of small cities, somehow you have to attract people over here. Because as I said, cities have to grow. They are a living organism. They have life, it's an ecosystem. It's just like an organism. The moment we don't grow, we will perish. Same way cities will also perish. And with this example, I'm gonna show you what happened to Charlotte versus Bridgeport. In 1950s, both these cities had the same number of people. 2014, Charlotte is sitting at 800,000 people. Charlotte, had, for many years, they were the fastest growing city in the US. Now they're the fifth fastest growing city in the US. You have to attract people. It is time for you to act, whether it's the city officials over here, the university guys, or the people over here. As the university, you have to attract people to come and join the university. How? It should be courses that just does not pile up debt on your students. There could be income share agreements. There are different ways to make sure that you are teaching courses that really do get them jobs or can make a good life for them. As a city, you have to attract capital, bring taxes down, and as people, you have to force your city and universities to do this. If not, this will perish. Now, we can go the spiritual route and say that, you know, we have to grow spiritually, but in reality, we are not the Buddhas or the mystics where we can say, you know, I don't have any responsibilities, and I'm just gonna walk away, and I don't need anything. Most of us, do have families, mortgages, we need a house. So it has to grow. If it doesn't grow, we will perish with the city. Thank you very much.